Thanks very much, Uncle Samuel, for reading so well. Thank you. Good morning, friends. Uh, Welcome to church. Great to see you. My name is Tim. If we haven't met, welcome, friends, connecting online. There will be a question time to follow, so hang on to your questions from this passage uh, as we work our way through it. Am I a little bit loud? I'm not too sure. It's ringing a bit for me. Aldrin, I'm looking at you. Are you happy? Aldrin, give me a nod. No, I'm waiting for a nod. No, he's adjusting, he's fiddling, he's turning the knobs madly. Come on, Eldrin. Great. I was going to have to start singing, otherwise. Uh, you don't want that. You don't want that. Let me begin with a question, friends. How much money is enough money, do you think? How would you answer that? Somebody asked you. How much money is enough? How much money is enough for you? Think about that for a moment. Uh, One very wealthy man was asked that question, this man, J.D. Rockefeller, John Davidson Rockefeller, the wealthiest man in the history of the United States. J.D. Rockefeller made his money through oil. He was an oil baron. His company was called Standard Oil. It's given birth to companies that you will know of, like Exxon and Mobil. At one point, J.D. controlled 90% of U.S. oil with his company, Standard Oil. At the time of his death in 1937, J.D. Rockefeller was worth US $336 billion. US $336 billion. And J.D. was once asked that question, J.D., how much money is enough? How much money is enough money? And J.D. answered, just a little bit more. I love that answer. Isn't that a wonderful answer, a powerful answer? Here is the richest man in the history of the United States, and he still wanted more. And aren't we all like that? Whether we have a lot of money or a little bit of money compared to others, how much is enough? More. We want a little bit more. It's a very powerful answer. It shows the power of money over the human heart. Often we think that we master our money, that we're in charge of it. But so often our money masters us. It enslaves us. It entraps us. And so we feel we just need a little bit more. Who of us really is content with what we have? Who of us really would say, I have enough or even too much. Whether we have a little or a lot, we just want a little bit more. I love Jesus' teaching about the kingdom. It is so practical, isn't it? As Tony said at the start, we we deal with money. We we have it. We deal with with it. We use it. Well, here Jesus teaches about the kingdom and money. Last week, the kingdom and marriage and divorce. This week, the kingdom and money. So practical, practical. So important. We need God's help, friends. Let's pray that God would help us. Let's pray. Father God, thank you so much that you are with us as we come to your word. And we pray that by your spirit that we might hear Jesus teaching this day. Help us to learn what Jesus and the kingdom means for money. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, in our passage, a man comes to Jesus And we know that he's rich. He's fabulously wealthy. Luke, in his gospel, adds that the man was a ruler. The man in our story is perhaps not just a rich man, but a successful rich man, a self-made man, an achiever. And his riches are a sign of his success, as is so often the case. Here is one example I thought of, the Australian woman, Melanie Perkins. You may know the name. She's responsible for Canva, the graphic design company, Canva. You may use it. Our church uses it sometimes for our flyers. It's a great company. She has been unbelievably successful. And so she's unbelievably rich. Her and her husband, Melanie Perkins and her husband, are worth about $8 billion. They're the 10th richest people in Australia, successful and therefore rich. That's the ruler in our story, successful and rich. And so he comes to Jesus, not shy, but confident. 
He asked Jesus his question. Good teacher, he asked. What must I do to inherit eternal life? What must I do? How do I achieve this? He asks. Right away, he's got it wrong. Totally wrong. He thinks that entering the kingdom of heaven is about doing things, achieving things, being religious, being good. Now, we can't be too hard on him. Most of the world think that heaven is earned by doing good and religious things. But the man has it completely wrong. Remember the children in the first part of our passage from Uncle Samuel. Mark has deliberately organized his material. In the passage just before the one with the rich young ruler, the children came to Jesus. Most likely they were babies. They had to be carried to Jesus. Jesus took them up in his arms. And Jesus uses the children as a teaching point. Verse 15. Truly I tell you, anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God like a little child... We'll never enter it. Wow. Children are a model for how to enter the kingdom of God. Why? Not because they're humble. They're not. Not because they're pure. They're not. Children are a model for how to enter the kingdom because they're dependent on others. They have to be. Children depend on adults for everything. The only one thing that children are good at is not being good at anything. They're dependent. They can't earn money and be successful like the ruler who comes to Jesus. They have to be given money, pocket money, as well as food and everything else. Children are trusting and dependent. For that is how you enter the kingdom of God. You depend on God's grace. And you let Jesus rescue you. It isn't by doing anything. It's by knowing that there's nothing you can do. As we sing in our church sometimes, nothing in my hand I bring. Simply to your cross I cling. Well, the rich ruler comes as the opposite of a child, proud and confident. And Jesus' answer begins to expose his heart. Verse 18, why do you call me good? Jesus answered, no one is good except God alone. It's a searching question. Jesus is saying, you call me good. If I am, if I'm truly good, I'm God. And you need to worship me. You need to follow me. Do you? For us, as readers of Mark's gospel... Ten chapters in, we can be in no doubt that Jesus is God. And that if we want to enter God's kingdom, it's going to center on our connection to Jesus. God in the flesh. Jesus goes on to expose this man's heart. Verse 19, you know the commandments. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony. You shall not defraud. Honor your father and mother. And then the man answers, Teacher, he declared, all these I have kept since I was a boy. This man is successful, rich, and good. I don't think he's saying that he's perfect. He's saying that in an outward public sense, he's blameless. Paul does the same thing in Philippians, describing his life as a Jew before he met Jesus. He said that in an outward public sense, he was righteous. He kept the law. That's our man. There's no public scandal around this man. No shame. In a visible, public, external sense, he has kept the law. But of course, God looks deeper than the external. God looks to the heart. And we all have a problem there, including this man. And that's where Jesus goes next. 
Verse 21, Jesus looked at him and loved him. One thing you lack, he said. Go sell everything you have and give to the poor. And you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. At this the man's face fell. He went away sad because he had great wealth. Jesus knew the issue for this man. He loved his money. He had a lot of it and he loved it. Maybe he loved it because of the power that it gave him. Maybe he loved it because of the the lifestyle that it allowed him to live. Maybe he loved it because it was a mark of success before his family and friends and community. I saw this quote as I was preparing about the danger of money. I think this quote says it well. Because wealth brings security against the unexpected, power over others, and the possibility of a self-indulgent lifestyle, it is much sought after by those who believe that this world is all there is to human existence. It is, therefore, the most subtle and powerful of the false gods, as Jesus knew well. How hard it is to put riches to one side so as to lay hold of Jesus and eternal life in the kingdom of God. For this man in our story, money was his God. He had, of course, broken the law at this point. He was proud of his record in keeping the Ten Commandments, at least numbers 6 to 10, but he had failed at number 1. Do you remember number 1? You shall have no gods before me, says God. This man's first God was money. And because money came first in his heart, he wouldn't give it up. Even for the true and living God, Jesus Christ, standing before his eyes, he kept his money and he walked away from Jesus and his kingdom. What a foolish, what a tragic, tragic decision. I want you to notice something, friends. Mark included a beautiful detail. Before Jesus made this strong demand, this strong invitation to this man to sell all of his possessions, just before that, Mark tells us that Jesus looked at him and got angry with him. No. Looked at him and rebuked him. No. Looked at him and loved him. I wonder if you noticed that. Jesus' invitation to this man is out of love. Jesus doesn't tell him to sell all his possessions to make the man suffer in poverty on the side of the street. That that is not what Jesus wants. Jesus wants our best. This man's best. Your best. My best. Jesus loved this man. He knew that the man was trapped. Trapped by his love of money and out of love for him. Jesus is inviting him to be rescued. Not just rescued. Jesus promises him true treasure. Treasure in heaven. Treasure that will last. The treasure of eternal life. Because Jesus loved him. I don't think this invitation to this man to sell everything is for all of us. I don't think that. But this man needed to make a radical decision like that. And if we're clinging to money more tightly than we're clinging to Jesus, so that we love money more than we love Jesus, Jesus lovingly tells us to let it go. Jesus loves us way too much to let us perish with our money There is an illustration, you may have heard it, but but if ever it works for the Bible, it's for this passage. It's the illustration of how to trap a monkey. There's a little picture if it helps. You empty out a coconut, you put a bit of fruit inside with a hole just big enough for the piece of fruit to, to go in or to come out. You fix it to a tree. 
A monkey will put their hand in through the hole, grab the piece of fruit, and while they're holding it, they, they, they can't get their hand out of the coconut. They are trapped. They're fixed to the coconut. The coconut is fixed to the tree, and you can drop a net over them. The monkey would rather be caught with the piece of fruit that he can't even get to than to let it go and live. So it is with this man. His grasp of his money has caught him. He's trapped. And while he holds on to it and loves it and worships it, putting it before Jesus, he's destined for misery. Jesus, in love, tells him what he must do to be saved. Release it. Let it go. Rely not on himself and his success and his riches, but come to Jesus like a dependent child and follow Jesus. Jesus calls to him in love. Tragically, the man refuses and walks away sad. We see the great danger of wealth, don't we? Jesus expands on it. He says it's actually impossible for the rich to be saved. Easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for the rich to be saved. Jesus thinks of the biggest animal in Palestine, a camel. He thinks of the smallest thing he can, the eye of a needle. You can't get one through the other. It's impossible. Except for God. It takes the work of God on a human heart for the rich to be saved. Most of us, friends, listening today are very rich. Not all of us, but most of us. In the world's terms, we're very rich. 80% of the world's population live on less than $10 a day. Most of us here live on a whole lot more than that. We have money saved up in our bank accounts, food in our fridges, and clothes in our wardrobes. We are rich. It's not wrong to be rich. But it is dangerous. And we must look to our hearts. What is our first love? Is it money? Or is it Jesus? For it cannot be both, Jesus says elsewhere. One will always come first. What is it for you? Jesus calls us to put him first. The rich young ruler refused and walked away sad, but the disciples had. They have left their other treasures and they are following Jesus. They've left their livelihood, their homes, their families, and they're following Jesus. And Jesus calls us to do the same. Jesus must come first. He's God, He's the King, He's our Savior. We can't give Jesus a compartment in our lives. We must give Jesus mastery over our lives. And if we do, we will be blessed both now in this life and in the age to come. Verse 29, truly I tell you, Jesus replied, no one who has left home or brothers or sisters or mother or father, or children, or fields, for me and the gospel will fail to receive a hundred times as much in this present age. Homes, brothers, sisters, mothers, children, and fields, along with persecutions, and in the age to come, eternal life. But many who are first will be last, and the last first. The principle is this, friends. You cannot outgive Jesus. You give things up for Jesus and his kingdom, you will get them back. Not just the same amount, not double the amount, 100 fold, says Jesus. That is an extraordinary return. There's no financial institution offering that kind of return. You put your money on a term deposit at the moment, you get back something like 0.3% per year. Jesus offers 100-fold in this lifetime as you invest in his kingdom. And haven't we found that to be true? 
We may feel the cooling of family relationships now that we are living for Jesus, number one. And yet we know the joy of being part of a spiritual family with new brothers and sisters from around the world gathered into our church, this church, our family, our new family, with whom we meet week by week. What a joy. New brothers and sisters in the kingdom of God. Or maybe we've limited our career prospects because we're living for Jesus and his kingdom. Maybe we take time out so as to serve in a ministry and we have found the joy of serving in an eternally significant work, building the kingdom of God. Yes, there are sufferings as well, says Jesus. It's not all blessings. It's blessings, yes, and persecutions. But there are extraordinary joys and blessings in this life when you put Jesus first. And in the age to come, eternal life. You cannot outgive Jesus. Two points of application as I close, friends. Two points of application. First, come to Jesus. Come to Jesus. Have you? Christ is the greatest treasure there is. You are not poor if you come to Jesus. Christ is the treasure of infinite worth. Jesus is the pearl of great price. In Christ, we have the forgiveness of our sins. In Christ, we are filled with the spirit of the living God. Through Christ, we are called children of God. In Christ, we are given an eternal inheritance that can never perish. Life forever in heaven with God and all of his people. Come to Christ like a child. Don't trust in your performance, your religious activity, your success or your money. Trust in Christ and his death on the cross for you. And you will be rich. Come to Jesus today, friends. And if you have come to Christ, serve Jesus with your money. It means being generous. And you must. Your money must reflect that you have a new master. Jesus, not money, Jesus. So give. Do you? Do you, friend? If you don't, start today. Give. Now that you know that Jesus is number one, your God, your first thought with your money must be, how can I serve Jesus and his cause with my money? How much can I give to Jesus and his cause, to the church, to to missionary organizations, to the poor? Give. Life in the kingdom is intensely practical. It's not enough to just want to be generous with your money. You have to actually give. Until you've transferred that money and given, you cannot say that Jesus has mastery over your money. Your money has mastery over you. Don't walk away sad like this rich ruler. Walk in joy now that you've found Christ, your true and lasting treasure. And give joyfully and generously to the cause of the one who gave all for you. Give. Remember at the start that question I asked that J.D. Rockefeller answered, how much money is enough? Just a little bit more. That was J.D.'s answer. I started with that. Let me finish with the words of a Christian man, a converted man. John Newton, two verses from his hymn, The Power of Grace. And notice the contrast, friends. Since I have known the Saviour's name and what for me he bore, no more I toil for empty fame. I thirst for gold no more. Placed by his hand in this retreat, I make his love my theme. 
and see that all the world calls great is but a waking dream. Let's pray, friends. Just take a moment, friends, to reflect on the passage and what it might mean for you. Just half a minute. Father in heaven, we thank you for every good gift you give, including the gift of money. Every good gift comes from your hand and we give you thanks. But Father God, we thank you for true treasure, the treasure of the Lord Jesus Christ, the wonder of his kingdom come, the joy of the forgiveness of sins, of having our names written in heaven. Father, give us eyes to see the true worth of Jesus, your son, and his kingdom Protect every one of us listening from the love of money. Help us to love Christ, our master and our God, and serve him with all that we have, including the gift of money that you entrust to us. We pray that there would not be one of us here who would walk away sad, saying yes to money and no to Jesus. May every one of us have the opposite experience walking in joy, having found our true treasure, Jesus. And we pray now that Jesus would rule every part of our lives and that we would joyfully serve him, including with our money. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.